you're doing well during this crazy time. I'm very thankful to be working from home, but I have to say, working from home, I don't get a chance to see the kids, so I miss all the kids. I miss my church family, and I look forward to the day that we can all be back together again. Um, Kaylin, why don't you tell them what you're up to? Well, basically all I've been doing is sleeping in, and that's... <laughs> yes, she has. Um, I mean, I've been doing better though, but uh, it's been nice not being able to get up early for school. Um, for the rest of the year, now I have to do online school, which isn't great, but it's what I gotta do. Um, most, of the, most of my free time, I've just been FaceTiming friends and playing video games. That's about it. So... <laughs> Um, a verse that I'd like to read for you is Romans 15, 13, and it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So we just want to let everybody know that we miss you, and we cannot wait to see you all. So everybody have a great Sunday. Hey, MCBC, we miss you. Here's a verse we thought is encouraging. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, I will walk by faith even when I cannot see. Hi, MCBC family. We just wanted to say that we miss you guys. We've been thinking about you guys, and we're praying for you. And we wanted to send a little bit of encouragement your way. I'm just going to read from Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of all peace will be with you. We love you guys. We look forward to seeing you guys soon and being able to worship with you. Have a good Sunday. Bye, guys. Bye. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service today, Michigan Center Bible Church. I'm glad you could join us. In 1968, a Welsh singer by the name of Mary Hopkins recorded a song that was recorded by Paul McCartney and the Beatles uh, that hit number two on the top 100 U.S. Billboard chart. And the title of that song was, Those Were the Days, My Friend. The first verse goes, Once upon a time there was a tavern where we used to raise a glass or two. Remember how we laughed away the hours and think of all the great things we would do? Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. We'd sing and dance forever and a day. We lived the life we choose. We'd fight and never lose, for we we're young and sure to have our way. Those were the days, my friends, we thought they'd never end. We are now in week eight of the mandate that we need to stay home. These are unusual times at the least. I trust that you're doing well. If you do have a need, any need at all, that we can help with, please don't hesitate to call the church office. Scripture tells us about the early church from Acts chapter two. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. If a need develops, we'll handle, handle it discreetly. Please make sure you call the office. I'd like to start with a word of prayer, please. Gracious Father, we are in an unusual time, as I mentioned, and we just pray, Lord, that you'd be with our government, both the local and the state and the federal government. Lord, that you would please give our leaders wisdom and discernment. We pray for those who are on the front line, the workers, the hospitals, and the police department, the fire department. We pray, Father, for those who are in our food industry. We pray for their safety. Again, we pray for discernment for them as well. We pray for families who have family members that are sick with the COVID-19. And for those who have lost someone, Lord, 
We pray for our community as people are struggling to make ends meet because of unemployment. We pray, Father, for the, those who are in depression from the isolation. We pray for the elderly, for the time when they're not with their families and the time that is confusing. We pray for Michigan Center Bible Church family, for connecting, for being oppor having opportunities to be encouragers, and Lord, for an opportunity to share the gospel. And as we get into your word today, Lord, we just pray that you'd please challenge us. And we ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. I'd like to make sure you please open your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And as you're turning there, a little background. Solomon, uh, David's son, the king of Jerusalem, is uh, doing a lifelong quest about the meaning of life. And the quest did not end with the way that we thought it should end. Usually people try to figure out what life's all about. They hope that they'll come to a simple, clear answer, something that you can put on a poster and hang on your bedroom wall. But this preacher king never seemed to get the final answer. The more he looked, the more he struggled to make sense of this world. So Solomon was looking for the meaning of life it was like chasing after the sun. You don't read the book of Ecclesiastes like you read a, a novel or a mystery and you get to the end and everything is resolved. It's not there. It's not there through chapter, chapter 9. But you read this book in which we keep struggling with the problems of life. And as we struggle, we learn to trust God with the questions even when we don't have the answers. It's something that we learn to go through because God is sovereign. This is how the Christian life works. It's not just about what we get in the end, but also about how, what we become along the way. Every day, I have, you have the privilege of getting into, sitting down and getting into this book, the words of the one who created all things. Every day we have an opportunity to get, to let him speak to us and give us a thought or two. Max Lucado said this, if I don't do what he says, he doesn't burn the book or cancel my subscription. If I disagree with what he says, lightning doesn't split my swivel chair or an angel doesn't mark my name off the holy list. If I don't understand what he says, he doesn't call me a dummy. In fact, he calls me son and in a different page explains what I don't understand. That is remarkable. Last week, Jonathan taught Ecclesiastes chapter 8. In Ecclesiastes 8.15, we read this, So I commend the enjoyment of life because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in the toil of all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, if you look at verse 1, so I reflected. Let's stop right there. So I reflected. Solomon is looking back at all the things he has observed. In chapter 1, he talks about the repetitions of life. Generations come, generations go. The sun rises, the sun sets. The uh, eye takes in everything, the ear takes in everything, and yet they don't get filled in chapter 2, Solomon pursues pleasure and possessions, and he watches as people prepare for life, yet these things don't bring satisfaction. In chapter 3, Solomon reviews life. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to build up and a time to tear down, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to laugh, a time to weep. The pattern of life is mundane, but there will be a judgment in how you live that life. In chapter 4, Solomon studied man striving for what he thought was important in life, yet many were being oppressed, and some were envious of others, and yet others even isolated themselves. He observed that popularity was temporary. Solomon noted that two were better than one, and that was for production and protection and provision and for power. In chapter 5, Solomon warned about worship, that God is not impressed with vows. 
Also in chapter 5, he warned about the lust of money that it would never satisfy. And this continues into chapter 6, and that God has given us an ability to earn money, but does not guarantee that the man will enjoy what he gathers. That in the end, all that we've toiled for, all that we've enjoyed by someone, does not, they does not know how to conduct themselves or herself. We end up giving it to them or leaving it to them. And the chapter finishes with the question, who knows what is good? Chapter 7, Solomon explains what is better. Your reputation is better. Your soft heart is better. A constructive criticism or rebuke is better. Patience is better. He warns about self-righteousness and though through the comparison with others. In chapter 8, Solomon advises how we can act toward the authority of government. And we need to do that with wisdom and discernment when we have disagreement. So I reflected, Solomon says, I reflected on this. Here's a thought. There have been many things that Solomon failed to understand, but he never gave up his faith that God was in charge. So verse 1, so reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they are in God's hands, but no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. The Bible uses the hand of God to express God's power, his love, his supervision, and his control. It's a symbol of the sovereignty of God. There's an old song, old gospel song. He's got the whole world in his hands. Verse two, he's got the itty bitty baby in his hands. Verse three, he's got you and me brother in his hands. Verse four, he's got you and me sister in his hand. There's a life lesson here. For the faithful believer in Jesus Christ, the hand of God is an image of comfort and assurance. We are in God's hands. We know that the hands of Jesus were pierced for our transgressions as he was nailed to the cross. This gives us hope. It encourages us in our faith that we leave everything in God's hands. All of our burdens, all of our wants, all of our trials, all of our cares, we leave it in God's hands. The Savior who loves us and died for us also cares for us. Solomon, of course, was writing this 950 years before Jesus Christ's sacrifice. He's struggling to understand what God is doing in the world, whether it's love or hate, he says. When we think of God through the lens of love and hate, we understand that what God's love is his acceptance, and that hate refers to God's rejection. Romans chapter 9 says, Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Jacob is accepted by faith, and God, but, but Esau was rejected because of his unbelief. Solomon is wrestling with the thought that he reflects on that he's, of what he's observed. Does God love man or does God hate man? Will God accept man or will God reject man? Solomon hasn't lost the grip of the sovereignty of God, so Solomon knows that our fate is in God's hands. What Solomon does not know is whether God's hand is for us or against us. The scripture says, your right hand is filled with righteousness, Psalm 48. In Isaiah 41 we read, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. When, the, when our earthly life is over, we read this in Psalm 31. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, my, deliver me Lord, my faithful God. But scripture also says this, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews chapter 10. So listen, it's not enough to know that you're in God's hands. Everyone is in God's hands. 
The question is, is God's hand for us or against us? Is he our friend or our foe? Verse 2 and 3, back in Ecclesiastes 9, all share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so with the, those who are afraid to take them. Verse 3, this is an evil and everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterwards they join the dead. We have the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the people that are faithful, the people who have rejected faith. They all have the same fate, death. So in chapter 8, again, last week, Solomon told us, that things will go well for the righteous, but not for the wicked, in verse 12 and 13. There will be a day of judgment, but Solomon struggles with what is happening in the meantime. Why aren't the righteous blessed and the wicked cursed all through life? Solomon is thinking that is one reason why it's hard to tell God is for us or against us. The same thing happens to everyone, death. In verses 4 through 6, Solomon is sharing his thoughts. Life is futile. He later he stated earlier, excuse me, in Ecclesiastes 8, then I saw all that God had done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. Solomon is struggling. We have hope because we are in the hands of a sovereign God. But he states it's impossible for us to know if God is for us or against us. The same fate awaits us all. In verse 3, he uses the phrase, The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live. The word madness here means moral wildness that is impetuous and irrational. People commit lawless violence, like killing a police officer. They hurt the people that they love the most and that they need the most, including members of their own family. We are living in a mad, mad world. The word death is used several times in these passages. Most of us try to avoid thinking about death, but Solomon speaks about it often. He says, the living have hope. He compares the lions with the dogs. Lions are noble beasts. The lion served as a royal insignia in the house of David, which is also the emblem of our Messiah. He's the lion of Judah. On the other hand, we have dogs. I have a disclaimer here. I know that many people love dogs. I am a dog lover myself. But Solomon is saying in these days that these were, dogs were wild, filthy, garbage-eating scavengers. Even being a live dog or someone who's in poor circumstances is better than being a noble person who is dead or a lion, a majestic lion that is dead. In verses 5 and 10, I'd like you to look at this. Look at verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. Even the memory of them is forgotten. And then in verse 10, we read, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. So this is the idea. After you die, you can't change what you've done. The idea is that life is here, right now, and after you die, it's all canceled out. It makes life seem meaningless. You can't take your money or your possessions with you. You can't take your legacy. It will ultimately be forgotten. All your accomplishments will not matter. Some people read Ecclesiastes and think, there is nothing else beyond the grave. 
Don't forget Solomon wrote, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. What Ecclesiastes longs for is what the New Testament presents to us. The Apostle Paul wrote about death entering the world through one man, but also life came through to the world through one man. Would you take your scriptures, please, and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. If you're new to scripture, that's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Please follow along. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in the same way death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a commandment, as did Adam, who has a pattern of the one to come. Verse 15, But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespasses of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of the one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification. That brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man, there are many, uh, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many were made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul writes this in this passage, that that which comes by the, by Excuse me, that which comes by the man of Adam is sin and death and condemnation and disobedience. Sin increased, sin reigned, death reigned. And that which comes by the man Christ was righteousness, eternal life, justification, obedience, grace abound, grace reigned, and reigned in life. So Paul, Paul boils us all down in one sentence in chapter 6 of Romans. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The question has to be asked, how did Jesus redeem us from the curse of death? He did so by taking the curse of death on himself on Golgotha. Chapter, thir uh, chapter 3 of Galatians says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Mark Driscoll said it this way, the only way to get rid of death is to get rid of sin. So Jesus took care of both sin and death at the cross and through his resurrection. The promise that is given here is not just for eternal life. The promise is also for the abundant life, living life to the fullest as it was meant to be lived. If you go back, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 7 through 10. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favors what you do. 
Always be clothed in white and always join your head with oil. Anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you're going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. It's interesting that in, in verses 1 through five, uh, one through 6, Solomon's talking about there's wicked and there's good, and, they, and there's, there's clean and there's unclean, and those who offer sacrifice don't, and they all end up in the same place. And there's men that are full of evil and madness, and they know what? They're going to die, just like you talked about the lion and the dog. It doesn't make any difference if you're, if you're majestic or if you're poor, or if, if you're going to... You're going to all end up in the same place. You're going to die. But then he tells us that we need to enjoy this life. He says, go. Go is it's like a wake-up call. There's no time to waste. Stop complaining. Stop worrying. Stop thinking that you about your problems all the time. Stop being anxious. Go. Live life. The phrase carpe diem, seize the day. Make the most of every moment of life. We are encouraged to live life to the fullest as it was meant to be lived. How do we do this? John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But since the fall of mankind, instead of using God's gifts in our life as a means to express our gratitude and worship to Him, we use the gifts in rebellious ways. We use the gifts for ourselves. Food becomes gluttony, wine becomes drunkenness, sex becomes adultery, work becomes either an excuse to be lazy or it drives us to become a workaholic. We have rebelled against God's good design for life. There's a life lesson here. Jesus came to redeem us so that we can begin to live life according to God's good design. Romans chapter 5 verse 18 says this, so that as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification to life to all men. Scripture states that there's a blessing and a warning. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. How about you? How about you? Just the start of the stay-at-home mandate, how many forget what day it is? Get this, we're supposed to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. We need to be intentional by cultivating fun and joy and humor. We, may, we need to make every day a party. Happy people find joy even in the routine and the mundane. They enjoy the special times and events, so they also enjoy the daily grind. Can you enjoy life like that? If you look at verses 11 and 12, I have something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken into a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. So Solomon continues to speak about the frustration of life. And in verse 11, he talks about at the end, time and chance. Things are uncertain. Again, there's evidence that man is not in control. You see, life is unpredictable. No one will know when the hard times come. It's like a fish that gets caught in a net or a bird in a snare. People are all of a sudden caught in tragedy. We expect people that are wealthy or attractive or athletic to have successful areas in their lives. Talent can take you only so far. Everyone can, can, can control their actions they take. I can influence 
my, my own future choices, but God controls my destiny. Let me give you an illustration. One, ex one would expect that the fastest person to win the race, but this is not always true. In 2008, in the, in the Olympic Games in Beijing, American Lola Jones was expected to win the gold meter, a gold medal, excuse me, in the 100 meters hurdles. She was by far the fastest hurdler in the race, but she tripped on the ninth hurdle and finished not first, but seventh. Solomon stated, the race is not for the swift. Life is unpredictable. Even with time and chance, we know that God is in control. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read, According to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. God is in control. All things work for good. Romans chapter 8. From our perspective, there is still a problem. We do not necessarily know what God is doing no matter how strong, how smart, how wise, no man knows, verse 12, when, this, when his hour will come. Woody Allen put it this way, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Henry Ford was born the eldest of six children in 1863 in Dearborn, Michigan, about eight miles west of Detroit. He was raised in a farm that did not have running water or electricity. Henry Ford later in life purchased 1,300 acres and built a mansion called Fairlane, which still stands in Dearborn, Michigan today. Ford chose the beauty of the sloping banks of the River Rouge as a site for his new building. The mansion had 55 rooms on three floors with eight fireplaces, including one that was made of marble that stood 13 feet high. With a flick of the finger, he could provide light with any of the 550 switches in his home over the 31 square foot mansion that he lived in. Ford's ingenuity even reached to the power supply. He wanted to be independent from the public utilities, so he built a power plant at the cost of $200,000 right on the banks of the River Rouge, using finely machined turbines to feed electricity to the entire estate, even enough juice to sell to the public utilities in case there was an emergency. Ford's plan was to always have lights in his house. However, when a torrential rain hit Detroit in 1947, the River Rouge overflowed its banks and flooded the furnace under the boilers, smothering the fire, which in turn caused a steam pressure to fall. The turbine stopped spinning and the electricity failed for the first time in 40 years. Ironically, that was the very night that Henry Ford was laying on his bed dying. Though, uh, th though surrounded by the engineering marvel, he left this world as he had entered it. 87 years before in a cold house lighted by candles no one no man knows when his hour will come so in conclusion solomon wants us to think about two things he wants us to enjoy life to the fullest in view of the uncertainty of death and he wants us to know that life is unpredictable Life, enjoy life. Death is not an accident, it's an appointment. Everyone's going to have to face death. Enjoy life to the fullest. And life is unpredictable. Its misfortunes are inevitable and often inescapable. And the mercy of God tells us to expect the unexpected. When hardships come, even when it comes very suddenly, we should not be surprised. Even when life is good, should we not think of our own natural abilities will spare us when the times become hard? No matter how gifted we are, or how we pre well prepared we are, and how to take the advantages of the life that we have, we too will suffer on an evil day. But listen to these verses. Jesus says this, I have told you these things so that, you will, you, that in me you will have peace. 
In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The world peace doesn't mean the absence of chaos. It means that you're living in the presence of God, the sovereign God, the God that has you in his hands. Jesus also said that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief, Satan himself, through sin, comes to destroy and to steal our life. But Jesus, in our life, we have life like it's meant to be lived. We have the abundant life, a life that gives glory to God, a life that can have peace with God, a life that can live the assurance that God is in control of all things. I hope that as we've listened to what Solomon has to say, that we can reflect, where are you? Do you have that type of peace? Do you have that kind of contentment? Do you understand that God has got you in his hands? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? He came for one purpose, and that was to restore, redeem, reconcile. He wants to bring us back to God. And you can have Jesus Christ by just by faith, believing that he died on the cross for your sins and that his blood has paid the price for you and that you'll place your faith that he and he alone can forgive you of your sins. I hope that you will do that. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, we're thankful for the wisdom of your scriptures. And even though at times it seems that it's very discouraging, there's nothing new under the sun. Things are meaningless in life. Father, we pray that we'll live our life in such a way that we relive our life as Jesus told us, the abundant life. Father, give us the desire to live for you in such a way that we can infect other people. Give us the desire, Father, to be so completely um, connected to Jesus that it doesn't make a difference what's happening in the world around us. We have the assurance that God, our Heavenly Father, is in control. Lord, I pray that if anyone who does not know Christ as their personal Savior, that they have questions about this, that they won't be afraid to to call the church office and ask those questions. Lord, I pray that today someone or many people would turn to God, even during this time of the mandates that we have to stay isolated. And we ask these, son, ask these things in, the, in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that this has been an encouragement to you, and I pray that your life will go well because of Jesus Christ. Blessings on you.